Please join me in a pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's uh, May 8, 2017 uh, meeting. The first thing on the agenda is the swearing in of the full time firefighter, Adam Mills. Chief. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen of the board, we thank you very much for your opportunity to come in tonight and introduce Adam Mills, who is our newest firefighter. Uh, he comes from the Northampton Fire Department, where he spent the last year, and prior to that, and I'll get into that in just a moment, um, we, we have a very experienced firefighter that has joined us. So we'd like to welcome Adam. Come on up. Thank you, sir. Yes, absolutely. This is Jane Cypher. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We can get some pictures of you. I'm going to read a paragraph, and then I'll have you raise your right hand. We've done this before on the show, so you From the town of Hampton mm -hmm. and the county of Rockingham to Adam J. Mills of Exeter, New Hampshire, and the county of Rockingham. Whereas there is a vacancy in the office of firefighter in said town, and whereas we, the subscribers, have confidence in your ability and integrity to perform the duties of said office, we do hereby appoint you the said Adam J. Mills as firefighter of said town. And upon your taking the oath of office and having this appointment and the certificate of said oath of office recorded by the town clerk, you shall have the powers, perform the duties, and be subject to the liabilities of such office until another person shall be chosen and qualified in your stead. Given under my hand this 19th day of April 2017, Fred Welch, town manager. Please raise your hand and repeat after me. I, Adam J. Mills, I, Adam J. Mills, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will faithfully and impartially, that I will faithfully and impartially, discharge and perform, discharge and perform, all the duties incumbent upon me, all the duties incumbent upon me, as firefighter, as firefighter, according to the best of my abilities, according to the best of my abilities, agreeably to the rules and regulations, agreeably to the rules and regulations of this constitution, of this constitution, and the laws of the state of New Hampshire, and the laws of the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. So as I was describing to you earlier, Adam comes from the Northampton Fire Department where he spent the year as a firefighter and paramedic. Prior to that, Adam worked as a wildland firefighter for the state of California. He also worked for nine years as a lifeguard in the city of Malibu, California. So we're getting a very experienced par paramedic and provider here. We're very pleased about that. We're going to bring up Rebecca Fields to assist us. Hampton Firefighters and Northampton Fire that showed up today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay, we'll give it a minute for everybody that's just here for that to clear up. <laughs> Anybody that wants to stay, welcome. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a proclamation for the Municipal Clerks Week. And uh, Jane, if you want to come up here. <laughs> Municipal Clerks Week, May 7th through the 13th, 2017. Whereas the office of the town clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the town clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the town clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, 
And, whereas town clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of the neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, whereas the town clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, whereas town clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the town clerk through participation in education, programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international <laughs> professional organizations, whereas it's most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the office of the town clerk. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Hampton, do recognize the week of May 7th through May 13th, 2017, as Municipal Clerks Week, and further extend appreciation to our town clerk, Jane Seifer, and to all municipal clerks for their vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the communities they represent, dated this eighth day of May 2017. And I just want to add that I think we have a town clerk that's above all the other town clerks that we get a, a super job out of here and that Jane's really a great town clerk. So congratulations, Jane. Yep. Would you like to say something? If I can just add to that, I couldn't do it without my staff, Shirley, Davina, Cheryl, Anne, and Rosemary. They're fantastic. They work really hard every day for all of you and, and they deserve the kudos probably much more than I do because they're on the front line. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, next on the agenda we have a public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 colon 14 dash A proceedings amend and release of town owned deed restriction on formerly leased land and it's the first hearing and we are opening it at 7.07. Diane Crabtree and Douglas Gerson, 751 Ocean Boulevard, and Michael and Kelly Sexton, 4 3rd Street, release of deed restriction number four. The only structures permitted to be erected or placed upon such lot shall be one single family dwelling to allow two freestanding one family dwellings. And Mark, could you fill us in on this, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. This is the first, as you've said, the first public hearing under RSA 41 colon 14A concerning the property at 751 Ocean Boulevard, which also has a, it has a two unit condominium, two condominium unit uh, development. Uh, the second unit is located at an address of 4 3rd Street. And so, uh, this is one that has already been, on, per the statute, first to the Planning Board for its recommendation and also to the Conservation Commission, both of which have recommended. Attorney Stephen Shadala is here, uh, who uh, uh, has represented the people who are petitioning for this. I think it appropriate at this time to hear from him. Okay. You can sit there if you'd like. Uh, Doug, why don't you come on up with your wife? I'm going to have my clients come up if okay. that's okay with you. So I actually represent Diane Crabtree. Did and everybody has identify themselves? Yeah. yeah. Diane, this is Diane? Yep. And her husband, Doug Grierson. And in addition, the other property owners are also here, but I don't technically represent them. It's Mike and Kelly Sexton. They own the other unit. And so they, at least for purposes of this hearing, they join in the request. So for the record, my name is Stephen Shadala. I'm an attorney in my office in Salem, New Hampshire. Um, this matter came to me several months ago when my clients attempted to sell their property. They owned the, the oceanfront piece on this condominiumized lot. They bought it in uh, two, uh, 2011, intending it to be a summer home. Um, I think they'll tell you that their biggest mistake is that they didn't hire a lawyer. Uh, because they didn't hire a lawyer, they were unfamiliar with the title. They relied on the seller's counsel. They received a deed from a fellow named Palmazano that did not indicate that there were any restrictions on this property. They paid more than a half a million dollars for the property cash. There was no title search. They own the property for several years. They have a child that's heading into college. They have reasons that they want to sell the property. They listed it for sale with Carrie and Jan for Realtors. They got a buyer. The buyer hired an attorney. The attorney did a title search. 
the title search revealed that many years ago when the leased land was sold to a fellow named uh, Garen, there was a restriction in the deed that said there could not be more than two, uh, one dwelling on the lot. It's our contention that all along there's been more than one dwelling on that lot and that that probably was a mistake, but we really don't need to resolve that this evening. Uh, I have clients who are desperately trying to sell this property and they cannot because they didn't have counsel, they don't have title insurance, and they are basically stuck through no fault of their own other than not wanting to spend fees with a lawyer to do a title search. So if you look back, and, and Mark Gerald and I have been exchanging a lot of information on this, when you look back, you'll see a fellow named Palmazano bought the property, and in 2002 he appeared before the town, and he requested permission to take down the cottage that was there. Um, I have a photograph of what was there I can circulate it. It was a cottage similar to what you see along the beach. Um, he obtained uh, both a variance and planning board approval. Apparently when he made his applications, he indicated that this was not leased land and at some point in time it was and that was a misrepresentation on his behalf. But again, that had nothing to do with my clients. It was long before we ever bought the property. He got approval to take down this cottage. I'll show you a picture of it in a little bit. And he replaced it with a very substantial house, which is owned by the Sextons. And the Sextons live behind my clients. They all get along very well. Um, this, as I said, came to light once it became apparent that my clients could not sell the property. Um, the town, through the selectmen, issued a what I'll call a position vote uh, back in 2016, indicating that the selectmen would not enforce the restriction so long as a warrant article was passed by the townsfolk allowing the selectmen under RSA 41 to release the restriction. That warrant article passed this year, and that's why we are here before you. We are hoping that you will agree to release that restriction so that my clients can list their property and sell it at this point in time, because at this point they can't. Um, just so for the record, I want to give you a copy of the photograph of what we contend was there. Um, I have a few copies of it, if I may, I'll just circulate it so you can see what was there. Thank you. There's an arrow pointing to a little white cottage. I'll wait till it makes its way around. The little white cottage is the cottage that was taken down by virtue of what Palmisano did back in 2002. It was replaced by a three-story structure now owned by the Sextons. The house in front of that, you can see a little deck and a sloping uh, roof line. That is the property that my clients own and still own. It has not had any major renovations to it. It's always been the front parcel. It was there uh, at the time this cottage was there. Unfortunately, I can't date this cottage for you. Uh, I got this photograph from Peter Sari, an attorney you're probably familiar with. Um, he represented Palmisano at the time. He sent it to me as evidence that it wasn't a garage, it was actually a single family dwelling that was out back. Um, certainly it was there in 2002 when Mr. Palmisano appeared uh, before the other uh, boards of, this, of the town. I will tell you that I have looked back through the town tax assessment records and as far back as 1968, it shows two units on this property. Um, Certainly one of the houses is more substantial than the other, but the tax assessment for years has assessed two units on this property. So I really can't explain why the deed out from the lease land to, the, to Mr. Garin said only one single family dwelling when I think I can prove pretty readily that there were already two units. I think it was a mistake, but again, I don't think we need to resolve that this, this evening. Our hope is that over the next public meetings, you will get to the point where you vote to release that restriction so we can sell. Okay. Questions? Right now, I'm going to go to the public. Is anybody in the public that, that wishes to speak on this? You get anybody in the public? No? All right. I'll go to the board. Regina, or I'll tell you what, Fred, do you want to speak on this? No, oh, I think the facts have been fairly okay. stated. <clears throat> Regina? Yeah, I agree. I think facts have been fairly stated, and I know we, we have to have one more public session on this, and then and between now and then, if anyone does have anything that they like to... Uh, say on it they have the time to do that right yep Rick no I've um, heard a lot about this from several people thank you 
Bill? Look forward to our uh, next judicious, next public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the same thing. I've, I've read up on this and looked at it and okay. lots of mistakes made back in the... Yeah, so I'll go to the public one more time. Nobody out there. What we'll do is we'll close the public hearing at 7.15 and we will continue it at our next meeting, which will be May... 22nd, May 22nd, we'll continue the public hearing. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Public comment. Come up and state your name and address and... Good evening, Mary Louise Woolsey, 148 Little River Road in Hampton. I have two quick items for you this evening. Uh, as you know, the uh, Academy bond passed in, in the March election, and uh, I had asked council in 2016 uh, to draft an article to see that the two adjacent parcels were uh, given over to the school district uh, once the renovation bond passed. Um, the activity is going to start in July, and uh, I don't believe that the uh, exact dimensions and measurements on the properties, especially number two, uh, have been given to the school yet. They and their council need uh, specifics because the trucks, the contractors' trucks are going to have to be there. And they're going to need the use of that land. They've been leasing, the, uh, the school district has been leasing the land, but now uh, they need uh, help, whether it's from uh, our assessing officer or town council. But if that can be given to uh, Nathan Lunny as soon as possible, that will be a big help. Uh, number two on your um, purchasing policy, I did uh, watch the discussions in your meeting and I did get a copy of the synopsis. And most of the um, uh, changes regard uh, grammar and so forth. But I was rather um, puzzled uh, looking in the actual purchasing policy and procedures, uh, 718.3, uh, where it says that the, uh, unless otherwise determined in accordance with RSA 37 colon 6, or unless a waiver is granted by the Board of Selectmen, all purchases of supplies, materials, and services, including professional services other than legal services, the cost of which is estimated to exceed 50000 shall be after sealed bids or sealed proposals have been secured. I don't remember you discussing anything about raising the, the cap uh, had been 15000 How did you get to 50000 I don't remember a public... I know you've discussed the uh, actual <laughs> purchasing policy, but I don't recall, and I, I probably haven't listened every minute, but where did the increase to 50000 come from? Point of order, this is not interactive, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, if you will keep that in mind, I think it would help the public if they could understand, because that's quite a jump. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, from the public wishing to be here? Yes, I'm Lynn Larson. Um, I own two properties on Ocean Boulevard between Boar's Head and Winniconnet, and I'm here to talk about the transportation plan. Uh, it's my understanding that there was agreement to continue the transportation improvements from Boar's Head up to Winniconnet at some point, and that's now under discussion again. Um, I would just like to say that I support the continuation um, from Boar's Head to Winniconnet for a number of reasons. I did go around when this was before the Area Commission and obtained signatures of a number of the neighbors in the area in that section also. Um, the uh, the seawall barrier there, the sidewalk to the seawall barrier in that section is um, very dangerous. Uh, you can't step up to the curb. It's it's much too high. Um, the traffic pattern right around Winniconnet there as it comes off Ocean Boulevard has been the scene of many accidents and near accidents. I see them 
every day people don't know where to turn there and they go the wrong way all the time and there have been um, some pretty bad accidents there. Um, there's a lot of speeding in that section of the roadway and uh, I thought the plan to reduce the number of traffic lanes was a really good plan to slow down the traffic in that section. So I'd uh, just like to say that I would like to see that that continue to be under consideration. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the public wishing to be heard? I believe the fellow who just stepped up out was... The, the fellow he was talking to, I thought that he wanted to come up here. Can we... Oh, no, sir. No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, announcements in community calendar. Regina. No, I don't have anything. Congratulations on your new hire. Thank you, Another addition to uh, Hampton Fire Department. Very nice. Rick. Um, I wanted to congratulate uh, Winnicott High School for being a school of excellence that I was reading about in the paper. It sounds wonderful, and I heard about the excitement that it is already causing with the kids. Many people are very excited. So congratulations to the Winnicott School System. Dean. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Winnicott High School for letting me graduate there in four years. It's a great high school. Uh, I did not distinguish myself there, and uh, it is a great high school. And as you uh, get out and around uh, in the state, across this country, and across the world, uh, people uh, equipped with that education uh, are, are well equipped to uh, to uh, stand eye to eye with any of their peers. And I see some uh, some equally fine, distinguished, winning kind of warriors in the back there. So, great high school, uh, great educators, and great parents, and uh, great contributors to the community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also would like to uh, congratulate them, and I, I go over a lot to the uh, athletic events, and uh, it's always well-behaved uh, students around there. It, it's really pleasant, and I, it always surprises me that when they play the national anthem before a sporting event, all the practice fields stop also, so it's very respectful. I think that's very good. Uh, consent agenda, committee appointments, cable advi TV advisory, Paul Paquette and Peter Reed, highway safety, Walter Kivlin, library trustee, alternate, Elizabeth Karek, mosquito control commission, Russ Bernstein, license for coin-operated amusement devices, Hampton Beach Amusement Corporation, 211 Ocean Boulevard, taxi operator's license, Burton Root Surfside Taxi, Raffle permit for HYA Seacoast Storm and permit to close Public Road, Pine Road Neighborhood Party, 52817. Make a motion that we move the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Approval of minutes, April 17th, 2017. Public and non public sealed minutes. I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? April 24th, 2017, public and non-public sealed minutes. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Uh, good. Appointments. Donna Bennett, tax collector. <coughs> A, 2014 tax deeding. Good evening. Good evening. I have a nice update for you. I think you'll all be happy with <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So the deeding started off this year with our usual 70, 75 homes um, to start with. Got it down to 39 last time I met with you, or 37 around that area. We are now down to nine properties, which is made up um, from seven people, but nine parcels. Um, if I go down the list real quick, maybe um, number one on the prop on the list cannot be deeded because it's in bankruptcy, so we can't touch that till it comes out of bankruptcy. So that one was a, I didn't even prepare you guys with that one. Uh, four properties to be deeded to, uh, to conservation. They're all marshlands. We haven't um, all the mail gets returned. No uh, relatives that we could find. And so you're recommending that they proceed to to deed that to, one to deed. Those. Yeah. So we need a vote on that. I believe. We need a vote. So move to deeds property two through five from the enclosure. I'll second. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. 
Uh, property number six, we'd like to try a payment agreement with that property. First time on the list here, and she's already made two, two payments towards that. That will get her off the list for next year with this payment agreement, and she will continue until those uh, property taxes are current. I'll make a motion for a payment agreement for number six. Second. All in favor? And as a, as a consequence of that, a form waiver would be generated that will reference that agreement. I don't have that waiver with me tonight, but I will have it for your next meeting. Um, the property number seven and eight, it's basically two parcels, but one par property. One is leased land. The property owner passed away uh, last year and is just now into probate, which means that we are just finding out who the probate administrator is, and they haven't been formally notified, even though the family has been notified. Um, I would like to revisit that in 90 days if possible and um, give them a little time to sell the property, which is what they're trying to do. And same with uh, property. Need a vote on that? Yes, and that would be to uh, forego the deeding at this time. Uh, that motion. Second it. All in favor? Unanimous. And the last property on the list, um, we would like to um, revisit that one in 90 days as well. That one is. Um, uh, they owe taxes on 13 and 14 and have listed the property properties for sale. They've actually had a showing and a potential offer. So moved on property number nine. Second. All in favor? Very good. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. And you've done a good job of Thank getting you. it down to just nine. Yeah, we did, we did a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have Next, nice Ed Tinker, Chief Assessor, 2017 first half real estate property <laughs> tax warrant. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, you have before you uh, the 2017 first half property tax warrant. It's in the amount of $26,686,666. Any questions? Regina? I have no questions, no. Mr. Griffin? Mr. Bean? The appropriate motion would be? Move to execute the warrant. So moved. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Well no. done, Mr. Tinker. Thank you. Next on the appointment list, Barbara Renault, Cons Conservation Commission, Chairman, Selectman Approval, RSA 36-A, colon 4 of Conservation Commission's acquisition of Map 66, Lot 1, as mitigation for Cornerstone Project's wetlands impacts and authorization of town manager to sign D. Uh, this is a uh, one piece still to be uh, some things filled in with regard to the uh, Cornerstone property and another development that is occurring out uh, in the uh, Liberty Lane area. And what uh, Chairman Renault is giving you is the Conservation Commission's letter to the board uh, dated June 8, 2016. Uh, this letter uh, memorializes the Commission's votes to accept various uh, transfers of land and uh, gives you also a map that to uh, go by as well. And what we're talking about is in, in the first instance is a uh, parcel which is a six acre parcel which is map 66 lot one and this particular parcel is one which is being deeded to the commission as mitigation for the wetlands impacts that will occur from the development of the cornerstone facility and uh, under RSA 36 hyphen a colon four uh, the commission is authorized is empowered to accept uh, uh, deeds of parcels. Uh, on the other hand, uh, each one of those acceptances is subject to the approval of this body. And so uh, that is why we're here for this. Uh, the board has previously authorized uh, the uh, so-called conservation easement swap uh, by which um, a 50-year a, a uh, conservation easement on the cornerstone parcel has been uh, removed by the probate court's order terminated in return for yet another parcel. But this has to do with a separate issue, which is mitigation of wetlands impacts. 
and so I believe I provided the board with a, a motion, but I can read it if you'd like. Would you please? Yes. The motion for the approval of this board would be, I hereby move to approve the Conservation Commission's acceptance under RSA 36 hyphen capital A colon 4 of title to map 66 lot 1 as mitigation for the wetlands impacts to occur as part of the cornerstone facility construction and to authorize the town manager to sign the approval line on the conveyance document in behalf of the Board of Selectmen. I'll make that said motion. Uh, does anybody have any discussion on Regina? I don't have any. Rick? Bill? Negative, sir. It's something we've discussed in, in the past and we've gone through it and you've you given us a whole... June 13th, two yep. weeks after that. Yes, several times. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, all in favor? Unanimous. And uh, just as a side note, uh, we've, uh, after many months of work by a number of uh, people, especially town management staff on this end, uh, we've come to the point where the sewer documents that were of uh, this board has addressed a couple of times before are now at the point of being in a final form and suitable for the manager's signature as you have authorized. And the uh, closing of the Cornerstone property is, is now scheduled for Thursday of this week. Uh, it's uh, a major uh, welcome development for, the, for this town, as this board has previously expressed. And I'm very happy to report that the numerous complex issues that were involved in that, involving, among other things, a, a, an entire private sewer system and a pipe under Route 101, uh, have been resolved and are reflected in the documents that will be signed uh, utilizing the principles that this board has already approved. So I'm very happy to report that and uh, progress will now be made. And so uh, the second item has to do with uh, the adjacent parcel. Again, it's uh, mitigation in part of impacts of wetlands, but this time mitigation of the impacts for the hotel office project of AG Hampton Hospitality LLC, four acres out of the six acre parcel of map 66 lot three represents mitigation for the wetlands impacts. This is part of the planning board's approval that just occurred at the second meeting in March of this year for the hotel office project. Again, a, 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 an application that was pending for a long time and which was awaiting the resolution of the sewer issues that similarly were involved in the cornerstone matter. And so, uh, Barbara, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. The two acres that, uh, the remaining two acres of the parcel um, were also uh, subject of the conservation easement swaps. So that particular parcel had two aspects. The two acres of it were being used as the conservation swap already approved but the four acres were mitigation for the hotel project. Uh, so the motion would be, I hereby move to approve the Conservation Commission's acceptance under RSA 36 hyphen capital A colon four of title to four acres out of map 66 lot three as mitigation for the wetlands impacts to occur as part of the hotel office construction project of AG Hampton Hospitality LLC and to authorize the town manager to sign the approval line on the conveyance document in behalf of the Board of Selectmen. No questions. I'll make the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Right. Any discussion? This is something we went through before also, right, and we're all well aware of it, and it's all been out in the public, and... Yes. Right. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous. And if I... Uh, my Mr. Chairman, there is yet another aspect of the cornerstone matter that is uh, scheduled to be uh, closed on this Thursday. It's now listed under old business under notice of intent to cut cornerstone project Exeter Road. Um, could I ask the board's indulgence to take that up at this sure. time? Sure. Go ahead, Steve. Come on up. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good evening. That's it. Good evening. My name is Steve Paquette, uh, SPL Development Group, representing the Cornerstone Assisted Living Development. Um, very, very quick and simple. As part of our um, 
belated site start. We're thrilled to finally be getting underway, and uh, we're hoping to get started very, very quickly. So we've asked the board to approve the uh, timber cut form. Uh, I think I guess it's a fairly routine form, but uh, but we don't want to delay any further. So the closing will start Thursday. I didn't know if it needed to be brought to the attention of the selectmen at a meeting. Mark and Fred have been kind enough to present it. Uh, at tonight's agenda, so I'm just here. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But, uh, Fred, it is required to be signed by the board by statute. Okay. And and uh, they'd be free to cut once once it's signed and the property is properly transferred and recorded. Okay, and we have no problem. You have no problem with it, or right? no? Because you you approved everything else. Everything this else is just the, the tree cutting. And right. I do have a motion. All right, if you wish. Go ahead. I would be. I hereby move to approve the notice of intent to cut of Cornerstone at Hampton upon the condition that cutting shall not commence until a cornerstone becomes the holder of title to map 67 lot 1 and b all documents associated with the conservation swap as directed to be recorded in the approval by the probate court are executed and recorded in the rockingham county registry of deeds i will make that motion second all in favor good Thank you very Congratulations. Much. It's been a long it process. Has. It's been uh, 15 months since the project was approved by the planning board. So yeah. one obstacle after another, but through sheer tenacity on our part at our end, and and Mark and, and Fred, uh, I thank you for your support, and thank you for also bumping me a little bit ahead. So right, thank you, and good luck. And head out. Thank you. Good night. Next, Chief Ayotte, Fire Department. Good evening again. Good evening. You're a very sharp gentleman. Thank you. Trying to keep up with Bill here. Oh, yeah, right. So thank you very much for allowing us to come in and speak with you and also to allow us to have the opportunity to share with Adam and his, uh, his girlfriend the opportunity to be sworn in. We do appreciate that. Uh, we'd like to thank you for allowing us to bring him here tonight. Um, Adam comes, he, he comes to us from the Northampton Fire Rescue where uh, he spent a year and completed his probation. Uh, he's a paramedic and a former state lifeguard in Malibu, California. He'll be an asset to the team, especially with all the open water rescues that we see. With, an addition of a probationary with the addition of probationary firefighter Mills, um, we now have a full complement. All vacancies have been filled. That's the first time this has occurred since at least 2014. His hiring brings all four groups to three paramedics per shift. We would like to thank um, we would like to thank you for helping us with the cleanup of the headquarters fire station, with the assistance of DPW director Chris Jacobs and Toby Spanauer and all of the wonderful crews. The overgrown bushes have been removed, the trees have been removed and cleared, and the entire area is looking great. We're truly grateful for their help. And on this Saturday at 10:30 in the morning, there will be a small ceremony out front as we plant a tree in dedication to firefighter Kyle Jameson, whose um, anniversary one year passing will be on Monday. Uh, news from the beach station, Ekman Construction has been working diligently to find the last areas of a possible leak. It seems that I tell you about this often, but they have been coming in every time that we've asked. Uh, we know this has taken a long time, and so do they, but they want to get it right. Uh, the company came in to make sure that it was right every time, and they do believe that they've um, isolated it now. They've assisted us with some other issues too, and as I stated in the report, during the blizzard at the beginning of April, several shingles blew off of the roof, and they took care of that for us while they were here. Attached to the quarterly report, you'll find a fire incident analysis, which provides a breakdown for your calls uh, for service for the Hampton Fire Rescue. And um, the following summary is as such. We have answered a total of 1,285 calls for service in the first third of 2017. The breakdown is 660 fire calls, and we have treated or uh, had 625 patient contacts. I did provide a historical comparison. The folks at home can't see that, but you'll see that the trend is upwards for the past five years. Changing slightly on this year, we're down about 15%, but we do anticipate that with the summer season upon us that those numbers will um, become comparable. On the fire side, we've been quite busy with a diverse range of calls. Since our last visit, we've responded to a total of 10 fires in town. Shortly after our visit in February, uh, we responded to a structure fire at 4 Huckleberry Lane. A neighbor informed us that the homeowner was at work, but that there were six dogs in the house and the firefighters were able to suppress the fire quickly and began to perform a search for the canines. Uh, the crews found them and worked feverishly to resuscitate the dogs. Unfortunately, five of the six perished. We were very happy to find one alive, and that dog was transported for emer uh, emergency veterinary care, and I'm happy to report that that dog is doing very well. 
Two other smaller fires resulted in minor damage uh, to residences in town, one in March and one in April. These smaller fires had significant potential. One was most likely caused by improper disposal of smoking materials, and another was a result of an accident involving materials left on a cooktop that was inadvertently turned on. On April 1st, during a significant snowstorm, crews responded to a tractor trailer rollover on Route 95. This truck was carrying 34,000 pounds of bananas. <laughs> Riding this truck took close to two hours. Uh, last week, Hampton Fire Rescue responded to another tractor trailer rollover at Route 101 to the on, uh, the on ramp to 95, and it was the second such event in the same location in the past four months. This truck was carrying lumber, and fortunately, uh, no injuries were um, incurred on either of these uh, rollover accidents. On April 10th, Engine 1 responded to a general alarm fire that occurred at the State Street Saloon in Portsmouth. The fire ultimately took three buildings and was the site of a catastrophic collapse. Thankfully, there were no fatalities and only minor injuries to two firefighters from other departments. Our crew was credited with saving the wooden exposure um, that was only a few feet from the fire buildings. They performed flawlessly under very demanding conditions. On April 15th, Marine One responded for a vessel taking on water, approximately three miles offshore. Our crew assisted the boat's crew with a dewatering pump and the vessel was able to make it into the harbor under its own power, with Hampton Fire remaining alongside aside to assist us if needed. The U.S. Coast Guard was also dispatched and arrived after the pump had been deployed. They accompanied the vessel to the entrance to the harbor and then uh, let Marine One take it the rest of the way. Emergency medical services, as I stated earlier, we had a total of 625 patient contacts since the beginning of the year. This translates to a decrease of about 15 percent from 2016 for that same time period, where we saw 745 patients. Of these calls this year, 11 were for overdose. Hampton Fire Rescue has administered Narcan a total of 16 times in the first third of this year, which is an increase of approximately 23% over last year. Opiate overdose remains a problem in our society and in our community. Unfortunately, if you have seen the news recently, you may be aware that there is a new drug that has been seen in the state of New Hampshire. In fact, it has caused three fatalities, uh, plus there were three other instances where the powder was identified upon submission to the lab. This drug is called carfentanil. It's an elephant tranquilizer. The lethal dose of this drug is unknown, but I provided some comparisons. Carfentanil is 10,000 times more potent than morphine. It's 100 times more potent than fentanyl, and fentanyl can be lethal in a two milligram dose. Two milligrams of powder is approximately the same size as President Lincoln's ear on a US penny, and the treatment for this type of overdose will require multiple doses of Narcan, which our providers are training to recognize. Aside from the obvious dangers associated with the use of the drug, this drug is able to be inhaled in the form of powder or absorbed through the skin. So these conditions place our responders at great risk. Any dose, regardless of route, could prove fatal. We have been training on the safety and the treatment of this substance and will continue to keep you updated. We remain vigilant to reduce the risk of injury and exposure to our providers and our patients. Last week, we enlisted the help of an outside agency to sanitize the ambulances to reduce the risk of cross-contamination. We clean after every call, they performed a deep sanit sanitization of the cab in the patient compartment. And in fire prevention, the Fire Prevention Bureau performed 67 inspections, issued 52 permits, and collected $3,370.35 in fees. The table below that I provided shows a comparison for the um, same time over the last three years. An indication that we are working hard, there's a change though you'll see in the 2016 numbers, 6,878 versus 3,370. In 2016, the volume of construction that we saw was much greater than it is in 2017. The amount of permits remains high, higher as a matter of fact, but the volume of construction and the fees that were associated with the board, um, they go on per square foot um, measurements, so that has a, a lot to do with the fee schedule. There have been no display fireworks inspections in 2017. However, we are meeting with the contractors on this Thursday to discuss the summer's events. A new um, contractor will be coming into town to provide the services. And as you know, there uh, was a vote at the state to allow firecrackers to be sold in the state of New Hampshire again. So we'll be discussing that fact with the fire marshal as well and what impact that will have on the communities. As the summer grows closer, we're seeing the call for inspections increase and as businesses are opening for the season. As a matter of fact, uh, Ms. Welch received, I think, a total of 17 calls this afternoon. We continue to see a very good response from the hotels and motels as we perform the work of annual inspection in these businesses. In our communications area, Hampton Fire Alarm answered a total of 7,668 calls in the first third of 2017. This translates to an average of 64 calls a day. During the blizzard on March 14th and 15th, 
Fire Alarm answered 327 calls, dispatching crews for a total of 85 calls for service in a matter of 24 hours. For administration, Hampton Fire Rescue has received the 2016 Homeland Security Grant to the, Department, uh, the New Hampshire Department of Homeland Security, totaling $6,000. With your assistance, we were able to purchase bulletproof vests, helmets, eye protection, and some specific medical supplies. These are part of the EMS and the warm zone components needed to keep our providers safe while they're operating in an active shooter or a hostile event scenario. We're working in concert with the Hampton Police Department to develop standard and operating procedures and training for the members to be able to deploy as members of the rescue task force during such events. Thank you very much for your consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I was reading about the car fentanyl, I think it was this weekend, and it's weird because if you look at that map, the states that it's like involved in is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty. It's disturbing because it's like, where is it coming from? That's a great question, and um, that certainly law enforcement has a better idea on that. Right. Um, we have seen it, and we're one of the smaller states. However, as you know, we already have an opiate problem in the state of New Hampshire. It's been recognized right. nationwide. Um, this is a very similar situation. It, it is considered an opiate. It's treated the same way. Uh, you may have seen that there was potentially a source that was identified and arrested this weekend up in Manchester, I believe it was. Yeah, and is, this is the one that you guys can just by inhaling it. Correct. Yeah. Okay, very scary and dangerous. It is. Thank you. Great job. I saw you guys in action the other day. Someone had uh, fallen off their bicycle right on uh, one, right on Route 1, but I think everything ended up being okay. That's good. But, uh, you guys got there quick. That's I great. made the call myself. Good job. Thank you. Rick? Nope. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you, sir. Nope. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to get this straight. I, I, yes, sir. People are doing elephant. Yes. Yes, sir. On purpose. Say, say that again. I just elephant tranquilizer. An elephant tranquilizer. So, uh, in the years past, late two th late nineteen nineties, early two thousands, um, there was a drug called Special K of ketamine, which is actually a drug that's being used in anesthesia now. But it's also a host tranquilizer, and they were using that at the time to, as a component of heroin and whatever the drugs they were mixing it with as a cocktail. This one now, they've stepped up their game, and it's, it's elephant tranquilizer. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your report, and yes, uh, as the report goes, you guys are busy. Yes, sir. And, you know, people have to realize all that you really do. And also, that you've got Marine One that you do, so you're doing, you know, a lot more than a lot of other fire departments That's are doing. And, and that your training is very, it's crucial to your mission. But that you do a great job, and, and congratulations, and uh, hopefully keep things going. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Just to keep you informed, too, and Mr. Walsh was instrumental in assisting us in getting this done. Um, the deputy has worked very hard with getting Ocean Rescue Systems, the, the provider for us for um, rescue swimmer and rescue boat oper operator training, to come to us, and they're coming first week of June? Yep. They're coming the first week of June, and all of our newest firefighters and one member from each group that are senior guys will be participating in this training again. So we're going to have rescue swimmers, save one, I believe, everybody will be rescue swimmer trained finally, and also rescue boat operator. That's great. So Yeah, we're very pleased. So it's always nice to have that on the coast. I took a ride through the uh, mouth of the Merrimack on Saturday morning. <laughs> Very exciting in the rain. Uh, <laughs> extremely exciting. It can be fun. Sporty, I think. <laughs> yeah. We come to you, too, with two <clears throat> other requests, if you don't mind, sir. We're on the agenda for two other items. That's all right. Yes, that's fine. All right. So the EMS officer vehicle replacement. This is actually, um, right now we have two Ford F-150s that were purchased in 2008. They were both, and Mr. Welch is the one who assisted me with this information, but they were for the fire prevention officer and the fire inspector at the time. Right? The fire, um, the EMS officer at the time was the deputy chief of operations, which was Chief Silver. Um, his car was the deputy chief's car. So the two vehicles were actually fire prevention vehicles. Currently, fire prevention officer Payne's vehicle is giving us fits. Uh, it won't start. Routinely, we're jump-starting it with other vehicles. We're having problems with the body. Um, the deputy has had significant amount of work this year alone to get it to pass inspection. The truck's failing, essentially. So what I'd like to do is ask you for permission to give Nate's car, the EMS officer's car, formerly the inspector's car, to the fire prevention officer so that he can use it to do his duties. And then I would like to use the EMS fund to purchase a Ford Explorer similar to what the deputy chief and police, uh, deputy police chief and chief of police have purchased for themselves as a Ford Explorer shorter version 
um, and we will look to purchase and equip that on the Mass State bid, which is how we purchased our command cars previously. So we're looking for your indulgence on that idea. Okay. Uh Let's go to the board. Any questions? So how much would it be coming out of the fund? Currently, uh, uh, well, the the vehicle comes in at $28,000 roughly, but uh, the deputy has also contacted them for trade-in with the vehicle that we would be looking to do, which is the 2008 Ford F-150 for um, $5,500. The total for the vehicle will be about twenty three five. dollars um, We have radios that we would be able to take out and just install, so it would be a labor cost there. Um, and then the package for lighting and um, and lettering, we're looking at approximately 29 to 30, I believe. And how much is in the uh, EMS fund? $318,000 as of May 25th. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Rick? Um, <clears throat> so, why is it that you use the mass uh, fund? The, the, um, the mass state bid list is a list that's created where all vendors provide their lowest bid for certain vehicles. Um, it's it's a method to have them listed so that there's no bidding process anymore uh, when it comes to that. New Hampshire doesn't participate. Uh, I was asked, I actually asked that question last week and they said, well, New Hampshire doesn't want to do anything that Mass does, was the, the simple answer around that. Um, but the Mass State bid list is what we purchased the command cars on because they're the lowest bid uh, allowable for all of the vendors. So any vehicle you look at, it's the lowest bid that you're going to be able to obtain for that vehicle. If you're looking for Chevy, if you're looking for Ford, that's the lowest possible bid um, amount that the, it's essentially a wholesale. So that's why we were looking to that. Thank you. Thank you. Phil? Chief? XO, thank you. No, sir. Okay. And how does that fit with our bid process? There'll be a plethora of paperwork that has to accompany the, uh, the purchase. But okay. As long as you approve it. Okay, and it's a legal bid <clears throat> because they have a provision in their regulation that says they can, a municipality may participate in the bid process. It's legal to purchase it. Okay. Do I have so a. So is that going to be doing anything with the, uh, the new bid process that we have? Actually, we've got no bid process other than the one we've always had at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. um, although we need to talk about some things in the bid process and perhaps later on on a new business or something. Yeah, because I would like to bring up about that $50,000. I think you haven't that I somehow yet. missed it. Yeah, we'll do that in the business. business. Right. Uh, so in this case, it's <coughs> fine. It's fine as long as all the pa proper paperwork is submitted to finance and, and, and yes, approved. Yeah. Which you're going to submit with, right, sir? You're going to get it for us, so we're going to review it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> already got most of it. Ready to go. Do we have a... Uh, I'll make a motion that we allow him to... Uh... We have a second. All in favor? Thank you. Unanimous. And do you have a waiver for 718-3 and 718-15 uh, B and D of the purchasing policy and procedure for the purchase of a fire truck? That's true. So on March 14th, we were able to, um, um, we were allowed to by warrant purchased the fire engine and as you know we were looking to do $150,000 set aside to buy a used vehicle for the purposes of replacing the reserve engine, engine 2. Um, there's no mechanism right now in the town to buy a used vehicle like that because used vehicles as you know if you've ever bought a used car they're not a bidding process there's nothing like that. The deputy's been working diligently to find a vehicle that would be suitable for our needs number one and number two accessible. Um, he's come across a couple of them but there's no, there's no method or mechanism for us to call them and um, barter or negotiate a better price. Uh, that $150,000 also was to account for the mechanical review, and we have a mechanic on standby to go down and evaluate the product. But we have no means to do it. The warrant article allowed the $150,000 from the undesignated fund, but it doesn't give us the mechanism to spend it. So we're not going to be able to go out to bid for a used vehicle. We need permission to be able to spend the money that was given to us through warrant, so we're coming here to ask for that waiver to be able to do that. Um, according to Mr. Welch, what we need to do is get a requisition, and in order to do that, I have to be allowed to do it by because this is going to exceed that $15,000 bidding policy. It's going to be an over $15,000. So it's kind of a little bit of a puzzle. Um, so we're here to, to ask permission to buy the truck, essentially. You want to? Yes. Pretty foggy, um, but basically yeah. he stated the facts. Uh, you're 
They're not going to participate in a bid to buy used piece of equipment. That's the problem. You're buying it from another town or city or district or whatever uh, that has a particular piece of equipment that's available, is in good condition, needs to be vetted to be sure it's in good condition, and then the town can purchase it uh, to keep a current vehicle on standby, because we have lost one vehicle that's on standby, that will allow you to have the number of pieces of equipment you need to meet fire dangers within the community as currently rated. Now, that's a that's a long story about, you. first of all, you've got to take from that $150,000 the money required to take a mechanic correct. and an officer to look at the piece of equipment, wherever it may be. That's correct. Uh, and that has to come out of that 150000 and the balance would be available to purchase the vehicle and transport it here. Right. So... That's the bottom line. Okay. You can do that by waiving, because there is there is no one's going to bid on it. That's for sure. Uh, but the only way to purchase it would be through a waiver. Gina. Okay, so you have it. The person lined up that's going to perform the service check. Oh, the mechanic. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you need to pay that, and then you got to buy the fire truck, which has all been approved at town meeting. That's correct. Obviously, there's no bidders for a used vehicle, so I would say we make the motion that would allow Chief Ayotte to go about and do what he has to do to get them to uh, get the fire truck. Process the paperwork and move forward. Right. Do we have a second? No, second it. Discussion? Do you want to say anything, Rick? No? no. Phil? Negative, sir. Thank you. Okay. It's not in Hawaii or anything that you don't. <laughs> no, I wish. I mean, they no. won't get that approved. <laughs> it's one of the warmest places, I'll tell you. All right. All in favor? <laughs> Unanimous. Thank you all Thank so you. much. Nothing else? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Good Thank night. <laughs> Next, Chris Jacobs, DPW director. Thank you. <laughs> Waivers from 718-3 and 718-15B of the purchasing policy and procedures, removal of granite abutments and regrading of Drakeside Road. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, this project uh, goes back uh, well, almost six years now. Back in 2011, we actually did have a bid to remove the granite abutments. Uh, on Drakeside Road so that we could raise the road grade up and get rid of that depression and that drainage issue that we have, the reoccurring drainage issue. Um, the bids that we received at the time, the lowest bidder actually said afterwards, even though we, we did not appropriate the money, we did not come forward with that, he called the office and said, I want nothing to do with the project. I, I lose my shirt basically. The second low bidder was this New England uh, Field Services. He, uh, Mr. Uh, Dennis, Dennis Thompson, he actually approached Fred afterwards and said, can I continue to work on this project? Can I, you know, do some uh, investigation? Basically what he's come up with is he's come up with a reuse of the blocks. Uh, he's going to use the blocks uh, as part of the reconstruction of a, uh, the seawall further up the ocean, uh, Northampton. Uh, so, um, where they would be, you know, the, the state does have some, if you will, color of title or ownership in those blocks. The blocks are essentially going to get used on another state project further up the road. He already has the Wetlands Bureau approval for that, uh, working with DREAD their approval, um, it's just a matter of that's So that's what's brought this whole thing to a forefront. The price that he's given us, 61232 is only 20000 higher than what the original bid was to remove all of the, the stone to begin with. And before he was going to remove it, transport it, and pile it up down at Public Works, what we would have done with it would have remained to be seen. At the end, function this or the end game in this is that we're going to end up regrading or getting re, uh, Drakeside Road regraded so that many of you know when it rains hard it fills with water in between there. We've had a number of drainage issues in there in the last year. The pavement's all falling apart there right now due to water table. Um, that would all get graded. It would be about a 1% pitch uh, coming from Lafayette Road up uh, heading west on Drakeside Road. Be a nice natural grade 
uh, the, once the granite's removed, the two earthen abutments behind them would get regraded. Uh, the, the material to uh, put in the road is within my stockpile. I'm currently working with contractors to get it uh, screened so I can haul it over there. And uh, the paving is within the paving budget. And this original funding was included within the paving budget, a uh, total scope of work for that particular road. And Drakeside Road was listed on the Warren article. Uh, I believe the, the wording that was used uh, included. Drakeside Road including the paving and roadway reconstruction required with the removal of railroad, railroad trestle abutments. So that was part of the approved work. So this is the vendor that has stepped forward, worked with the town for the last six years. And uh, we didn't plan on or weren't anticipating having to rebid the work, to be honest with you. Fred. The uh, estimated cost that Public Works said had worked out in order to do the work and go back out and rebid and having a, uh, someone else come in uh, who, who would win the, win the work was over $400,000. So this is a significant change for that. That money is in the paving budget because it's part of a paving program for a Drake Side Road and, and fixing that roadway where the abutments are now, the bridge abutments. Um, the remainder of the money would stay in the account uh, in order to one, pave this area, and it could be used to pave other roads in town so we can get a notch up on some of the other problems that we have. Uh, if we were to go out to bid, the estimated cost would be in excess of $450,000 to do this work, as we have estimated it and as the state has estimated it. So this is a really good deal for the town to get it done, get the road fixed, uh, restore the road to a full width of two lanes, <clears throat> and avoid a substantial flooding problem. One of the things that we've worried about in the past is that if we have a heavy flood there, and a car gets stalled, that road's completely shut off. There's no way for fire, police, or ambulance to get through without removing the vehicle, which would take time. Regina? So we're going to have, I'm sorry, uh, North, Northern New England Field Services do everything we need done. To do all the heavy lifting. The only thing I have to do is uh, pave the road. I have to buy the process gravel for the top six to nine inches, and I have to pave the road. Other than that, they do everything. So and I'll make that motion. All right, I'll okay. second it. And can we just uh, frame it and tighten it up, the motion, please? Um, you want to try to frame it in your, your best words uh, because you're the one going to do the work? And address the uh, uh, purchasing policy as well. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. I'm going to give that a swing here. Uh, make a motion that uh, the board accept the proposal from Northern New England Field Services to remove the granite abutments on Drakeside Road, uh, bring in fill, grade to uh, pursuant to the plan that has been prepared, uh, install uh, gravel with the town doing the ins construction inspection work, compaction test specifically, and the paving. And then, and, and then the waiver would be seven in the in the, in the amount of sixty one thousand two hundred and thirty two, uh, thus recommending a waiver of the town of Hampton's purchasing policy under seven eighteen colon fifteen C, uh, based upon that the project exceeds fifteen thousand dollars and was not um, rebid since two thousand eleven. And seven eighteen dash three. Seven eighteen dash three. That's you. the bidding requirement. That's the bidding. Requirement. Okay, so we have a we have a motion and a second, right? Uh, do we have any other discussion on this? I just want to say that it's long overdue. This has been talked about so many times. I anytime you talk to someone that lives out there, it always gets brought up. And this is this is one of the ways that Hampton does what it's supposed to. Uh, make this is a bad problem that is can't be kicked down the road any longer. Just like the one that. Uh, is was in the center of town where the water was cascading down off Dearborn Avenue 
and it's going to have something to do with what has to be done down at the beach on Ocean Boulevard too. This is the example I would like to use. I try to think of the two areas where the town has done what they have to do. This is one, and the other one is at the intersection of uh, Route 1 and High Street. And so I think that you'll do a good job, and I'm glad it's being done. Thank you. I, I just have one question. The, the company, do you know the company, and are you confident in their ability to do the work and their ability to do the work correctly? Yes, the town has indirectly used them before. They used to regrade the beach. Um, they are a um, preferred contractor of the Department of Transportation, uh, New Hampshire Wetlands Bureau, and DREAD. Um, this, the project they're going to be doing in Northampton will be the third or fourth project that they've done for DREAD. And this, that same Dennis Thompson in the Women Field Services was recently before this board in the last <coughs> meetings for I believe 1058 Ocean Boulevard. He's going to do the, remember he was doing the last uh, wall reconstruction uh, along that end. I'm going to access it from north, north, okay. uh, right. north Hampton. So this is the same gentleman. Okay. And do you have any idea of how they're going to do it? I mean, how, how much it's going to disrupt the traffic? I'm going to have to close the road. <coughs> okay. Because uh, trying to lift those blocks, I estimate the blocks are somewhere around the five ton range. Um, they're almost, uh, some of them are 10 and 12 feet long, about 36 by 36 square. Um, so I imagine he's only going to get one or two per flatbed haul. And then he's going to haul them up to North Hampton, have some other piece of equipment there to unload them. He estimates Monday through Friday, it'll take him, he figures, five or six working days. And then the, once the, uh, the head walls are out of the way, we go right to hauling gravel and grading and filling and compacting. And that uh, I may be able to, after that, end of that first week, open, reopen the road, gravel, uh, construction zone, you know, pass at your own risk, construction zone, and then uh, later in the summer, I'll have it paid. Do you, do, do, do you know when this would take place? We have agreed not to start the project until after school is out because we didn't want to disrupt bus routes. And um, so it, and that was fine with him. He's tied up through May, all of May and an early part of June. So, you know, we're looking at last week of June, the first two weeks of July, that time frame there. Okay, and, and how are we going to notify residents? Message boards will be put up on both ends, um, notifying them of the prior to the start of construction. Um, I already have an insurance certificate from this gentleman. Um, Plus, I have to work through some sort of contract, I'm sure, involving the legal department to get the manager to sign. Okay. So it'll be, well, good advance notice for everybody. Definitely. Yeah. And, and we're very sensitive to it because from the south, the DOT is working up their way to Drake Side Road. Aquarian is going to start working south from <laughs> the old salt uh, on the water line, and we're going to be right smack in the middle. But only hopefully for a week or two. Okay. Uh, so we have no other discussion. Can we have a vote? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, folks. Uh, nothing else, huh? Sad to say. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, may I? Uh, yeah. And, and don't expect a discussion on it tonight, but uh, you produced for the board the National Pollution Discharge and Elimination System Annual Report. Yes. I would like at uh, some point in the next couple of weeks when your very busy schedule um, uh, uh, doesn't let up, but you make the time to come in. It's a very important uh, document. Yes. Uh, the uh, back end of water usage infiltration. Uh, the scope and the breadth of uh, how important your department is, how large your department is, uh, and uh, if you can incorporate into your remarks uh, in this uh, some of your lessons learned when you met with uh, the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader and uh, key players uh, in terms of uh, uh, enterprise value, in terms of uh, um, how we actually handle this charge for this, and some of the uh, um, comments you heard from Speaker Jasper and his experiences over in uh, Hudson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Town Manager's Report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board, uh, New Hampshire Department of Transportation has begun construction work on United States Route 1 on the southbound side in Hampton at the Hampton Falls Town Line. 
please be careful negotiating the lane changes. They're very, very tight. They've also begun work uh, on uh, State Route 101 westbound near the US-1 up. Be cautious of the merging traffic. Traffic going through this area typically runs at 55 to 60 miles per hour moving west <coughs> on, on US on State 101. So it's a, it's a very dangerous area. We don't want to see anybody hurt out there, but they're beginning to work on that ramp, and please take due notice thereof. The Hampton Beach State Park will be holding its annual public meeting on May 16th at 5 p.m. at the Seashell Complex to receive public comments regarding operations of the state park and beach. And I, I will specifically ask people to go if they have any issues that they want to bring up. This is the time to do it. If you have any praise you wish to heap, this is the time to do it. Get that all out on, on the table so the uh, dread can understand what's really going on and how people feel about it. The uh, Hamptons uh, American Legion Post number 35 has announced its Memorial Day activities for May 29th. The morning ceremony will begin at 8 a.m. at the Hampton Beach Marine Memorial. The parade will take place at 11.30 a.m. It's in the parking lot next to the Winnicott Road Fire Station headquarters, moving west of Winnicott Road, north on Lafayette, east on High Street, and ending at the High Street Cemetery for uh, where they will be conducting ceremonies. Um, I think I have a couple of other things that I've scattered in here somewhere, but... Yes, perambulation. It's always one of our favorite subjects. Uh, the legislature did not eliminate perambulation, so we're still required to do it. I have been in constant contact with uh, our good friends in uh, Hampton Falls. Uh, they have the same problem we have, that is trying to get a majority of the board together to do it. So what they have done is they have appointed the town administrator and the chairman of the board of selectmen to do the preambulation that eliminates having a majority of the board present. Um, they're anxious to get that done. They would prefer to do it on a weekday morning uh, because that's when the chairman of the board of selectmen up there is available. Uh, and if everybody will send me their desires, we need at least three members of the board to be there and we need to post it in order for you to be, to be present as, as, as the board doing the preambulation. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll request I'll tag along with you because I know where the, where the bounds are, uh, and so does a, a gentleman from Hampton Falls. So with that, I guess we just need to make the arrangements to get it done. Okay. Mr. Chairman, may I? Sure. Yeah, and this is a serious question. The year is uh, 2017. If a select person is uh, uh, perambulating, uh, as you say, uh, and uh, encounters, uh, and this is a serious question, uh, some type of affliction from a tick and incurs Lyme disease. Are they covered by the workers' compensation under the town policy? Uh, as you know, the medical profession does not generally recognize Lyme disease. Okay. And what would be the alternatives to the uh, rational man and woman in, in this day and age, uh, despite what uh, our esteemed colleagues in uh, Concord um, might think in this, this antiquated law, with uh, alternative sources of uh, perhaps drone, Google Earth, uh, something that uh, can take a real-time or contemporary photo that uh, prevents people exposing themselves to uh, disease that is unreimbursed. We have the coordinates of all all the uh, markers. If, could you, uh, if, if the board's pleasure is to develop uh, alternative courses of action, I'm happy to um, address that issue with uh, any legislative body in Concord. It's a problem. I consider, uh, I consider it a serious threat. It is a threat. Um, my wife suffers from Lyme disease. Um, from walking on a, on a, on a, uh, a trail, uh, and I know several other people who have it. I did the preambulation last time we did the Hampton Falls, and I got to tell you, it's fairly wooded. It's densely wooded in some areas, uh, and yes, this is tick season. Thank you, sir. So, we, do we do we need a vote on finding an alternative method to the preambulation? I, I think you've instructed me to look. Okay, I will look. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any question for the uh, town manager, Regina? No, I have no questions. Thank you. Rick? No, but if you can't find an alternative measure, I could do it if it's on a Monday. Okay. Only a Monday. All right. And, and I, I gave you a time. I yes, think. sir, you did. Yep. Okay. So I can do mine in the uh, dead middle of winter where there's no tick threat. Thank you. 
We can make a frostbite, though. I, I mean, I could do Monday morning, too, but I do. My brother has Lyme disease, so it's very, it's a real thing, and it's yes. very serious. It's very bad. It's serious. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Old business. Uh, vote on RSA 41 colon 14 dash A proceedings amend and release of town owned deed restrictions on formerly leased land. Charles and Martha Foley, 7th 9th Street, request to amend deed restriction number three, fence height of no more than three feet to four feet. We had two public hearings on this. We heard the. Uh... I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. Um, that uh, both of these be to four feet. I would second that motion. Any discussion? I All right. think it's just we've already talked about yep. it. Yep. All practical. in favor? So we have changed the restrictions from three feet to four feet, not to six feet. On these two particular yeah. lots. Do we have to deny the six feet on, the, on that one, or just can we say just to four feet? <clears throat> I think just the action you've taken, the, the nature of the motion is sufficient. Okay. Okay, thank you. Then we're all set, and we've done that. Uh, and the notice of content, intent to cut, we've already done on Exeter Road. That's good? That's good. I have something I'd like to yes, bring up under old business. Um, Rick had mentioned, I think, a few weeks ago that the Hampton Beach Area Commission was going to be, your term's coming up for commissioner, so I would like to make a motion that we appoint Rick Griffin as uh, HBAC commissioner. Second. Again. All in favor? Unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else under old business? Okay, new business. Lions okay. Cup. Yeah, yeah, that's you. You've been nominated. <laughs> We're in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, New business, Lions Club donation, fencing and bench for Five Corners Playground, $7,000. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, they have asked to make a donation. Uh, the Five Corners Playground is being constructed. Um, somewhere in this confused mess of, of gobbledygook that's that I have it. here that's just been burying us all day long, I have some photographs which I will, when I find them, I will pass them around. But. Uh, the construction is almost finished down there. They've been doing a great job on it. Uh, the Lions Club has has uh, taken this on as a project, and uh, they're willing to uh, donate an additional uh, donate seven thousand dollars towards fencing and a bench at the playground. There'll be just a fence going around it, but it's just it's it's a it's a pole fence. Uh, uh, made out of metal, and there's there's two lines, I believe, of what I understand are black pipe connected to the posts, and uh, walk in uh, walk in areas, and and a, they're going to put a bench on the inside for people to sit on. And they, they put, I'd encourage people to get down and take a look at what they're doing. I think it's great. It looks terrific. Uh, they've really done a wonderful job on it. So a motion. I make a motion that we accept the donation. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't, I've seen that playground. They're doing a great job. Yeah. It really looks nice, and, and I think this would be a nice addition to it. All in favor? Unanimous. Request for DES to hold a public hearing on Aquarian's permit That's for the large one. groundwater oh, withdrawal yes. permit. Mark, do you want to speak on this? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, this board has been con um, uh, concerned for many months now regarding the supply capability of Aquarian Water Company, uh, especially in light of the situation encountered last year. We received a, uh, a graph uh, showing supply versus demand, and in, in, in two various dates last summer, uh, we came, Aquarian came very close to not having sufficient supply to meet the demand. On top of that, there was a drought situation. And on top of that, yet again, there, were a, there is a neighborhood in Stratum that has been ordered by DES to be temporarily interconnected with Aquarian to serve uh, 47 lots of worth of homes uh, that were, according to their own uh, uh, deed instruments, supposed to be taking care of their own water through their own wells. And so we're now very much concerned with supply and uh, 
have been meeting. Uh, the, there have been quarterly meetings by uh, the manager and uh, some of the selectmen with Aquarian, at which time they have given us information regarding their uh, infrastructure and its capacity. And they had alerted us to the fact that they were planning to propose a, another uh, well be developed in Hampton, uh, so-called well number 22. Uh, and so what DES has sent out is a notice indicating that uh, we have a deadline to request a public hearing for the project of 15 days from the date we received a copy of the preliminary application, uh, which is uh, th this size, a large document received last Wednesday. And uh, the 15 days would uh, elapse before the board's next meeting date. And so um, I think uh, there, if a public hearing is requested, then one will be held by uh, DES. Uh, but if there were no public hearing held, then there would be a 45-day written comment period without the benefit of the public hearing. I think there's much to be learned from a public hearing, and certainly Aquarian should articulate uh, what this well would generate as well as what its cost would be, because as we know, the cost of these infrastructure eventually falls on the ratepayers, if not through wicket charges, then through uh, the general next general rate case. This would be the cost of this would be added. In past, we've been told that the cost of this would be a half million dollars. So it's very important to know what would be getting for it and what customers would have to pay for it. Um, on top of that, you've heard about the developments that are occurring out on the Liberty Lane West area, and uh, we have a flow chart that indicates that approximately 46,000 gallons of water demand would be added as a result of the developments already approved by our planning board, that some of which are going to be started to be built uh, later this week. So uh, we have a number of demands that are uh, past and future being made on this Aquarian system, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, we're, we're, uh, something sensible is being done to meet them. And so I would request that the board uh, authorize the town manager and myself to request a public hearing in the town's behalf in response to the DES April 28, 2017 letter as to Aquarian Water Company's large groundwater withdrawal permit application. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion on this? Then we can have a discussion. If we have a motion. Yeah, I would make a motion that we request Any second? Yes. Second. All right. Uh, discussion, Regina, since you deal with, have dealt with Aquarian. Yes, and actually, as far as some of the things you just mentioned, I actually met with um, Carl and John Walsh this past Friday, and Carl subsequently sent me in some written documentation of what we talked about in the meeting that I just forwarded to Fred maybe about 5.30 right before I came down here. So... But I think, are you going to be meeting with Kyle sometime in the near future? Uh, I think Thursday. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so maybe I can, I want you to be able to look at that right. before you met him. It specifically talks about Wigan Way from Aquarian's point of view. So I think that having the public hearing would be really good. You know, we could have town's concerns, what Aquarian's stated goals are or whatever you want to call them, and then how, what's going to get addressed here. You know, the new implementation of well 22, how it's going to potentially affect other wells. I'm told it's probably going to happen. Uh, again, the real close line we came with supply and demand last July. And also, what this whole, you know, we stated pretty specifically last fall that we did not want to hook up the stratum. And now DES is ordering Aquarian to hook up the stratum. So, in my opinion, we need to all get together and figure out what's going on here. And I think um, the public hearing will be the way of doing that. So Anybody what's else? The public hearing going to be um, the DES actually schedules it. I uh, I don't know where it would be, but uh, I think it would make sense to be down here. Be better than up there in Concord, Definitely. where they are. Yep. You need to come where we are. Yeah, I think they ought to have it here. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Phil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gerald. And uh, we've uh, had uh, 
discussions here at the board. This is a uh, Town of Hampton issue. Uh, who will be uh, permitted to speak at this public uh, hearing? I guess I would ask uh, you, Mr. Chairman, you, Esquire, and you, you're the water select person. Um, we've had outside folks. Uh, I'm keenly interested in uh, the interest of Hampton residents, uh, not those that would uh, politic that live outside our borders uh, for such a precious natural resource in our exigent demands for both uh, the back end of water usage and consumption I would I mean in my opinion it should be Hampton residents Aquarian should be the primary and Business then perhaps owners. maybe other Aquarian already existing customers like perhaps if someone from Northampton just as far as you know representing the one side of Aquarian so I see this getting, uh, um, if, we, if we don't restrict it to Hampton residents, Hampton business owners, Hampton taxpayers, uh, and uh, perhaps the folks that were in here from Northampton that were closely aligned to, uh, and others, it could uh, develop into a carnival. Would we have the ability to restrict it? Uh, I think it's a DES production at that point. But nevertheless, if it was down here, I think we'd have more influence about how it's conducted, <coughs> especially if we offer the forum. All right. So, so in the motion, do you want to make the motion to request that it's in Hampton? Yes, we request Should, the public be, hearing in Hampton. If, if the board wishes, with Hampton issues. If the board wishes, we could offer this this room as a right. as a place for it, and uh, have better uh, okay say in how it should be conducted. It should be televised. And televised. televised. If, I, if I may further, Mr. Chairman, we know the intent of Wigan Way is to use. That, right. That's that's a given. That's a known. It's incontrovertible. It needs no further statement. I think we should include. Somehow we should make it known that we don't mind the people from Northampton and Rye that are also part of the existing customer. Okay, but we're not looking to give. Uh, Wiggins Way a show place. Here. I think it should be a way for existing customers of Aquarian, Hampton, 75%, Northampton, 15 whatever it is, and Rye, 5 or 10, to be able to state their concerns and Aquarian be there. Here's, here's our answers. Here's what we think. And DES is ordering it, so, I mean, I guess they have to be here, but in my mind, it should really be between Aquarian and its existing customers. So I would expect to, in making the request for the public hearing, to mention all those uh, okay. facets that we would like to have included okay. and so, offer this location for a televised public hearing. Okay. So all, all in favor? Unanimous. You're all set on that. Thank you. All right. Uh, route 1, reconstruction. 1A. I'll talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rick had something you need to say. Well, um, I brought this up to um, Fred's attention because right. um, at the last Hampton Area Commission, they have voted to, or William Rose has presented that uh, taking out the part from Horsehead to Winnicott Road. When, um, you know, we were given plenty of. Um, you know, a lot of people came and gave input. Uh, a lot of people from this area gave input. They're really, a lot of the input they took for the total project came from Facebook and probably people that don't even live in Hampton. Now, the Hampton Area Commission is a non, is a advisory only um, committee. Uh, the people that are on it are representative from the Chamber of Commerce, which is Bob Preston. Chuck Rage from the Village District, and Bob Ladd from the Village District, myself and John Nyan um, are representing the town of Hampton. I, you know, this is I'm not a selectman's representative. I'm representing the town of Hampton, as is John. There's also a, uh, the state is represented by D O T and D E S or Dread Dread Dread. And um, there's one member at large, which is allowed to come from any um, area, town, uh, and that's Dean Merrill. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that concern me, and I, pro I, I don't know, 
I'm not really sure William Rose mentioned that right from the beginning um, he, he got the input that it should be that area, which that I don't understand because right from the beginning when I heard them trying to make it only that area, I have spoke up every time. And uh, the town of Hampton has spent $12 million uh, on all the infrastructure down at the other end, all of, down at the beach, all of the, you know, the streets have been done over, the sidewalks have been done over, the drainage has been done over, the sewer uh, and water and a lot of other things were updated. Um, so one of the reasons why this is happening is the state has to uh, do the rest of it under Ocean Boulevard. And um, where there are many areas where there are many problems. But as far as I can see, the problems are actually more severe from Boar's Head to Winniconnet Road. There's been problems there that exist uh, for, there's all kinds of problems and different, uh, there's many different ways to look at them. Um, and this is something that the can, it's another one of those things, the can just gets, keeps getting kicked down the road, kicked down the road. And, you know, the state is taking a lot of money out of here. Uh, it's not fair to the people that live in that area from Boar's Head to Winniconnet Road that they get, if, if we had issues uh, like what they're facing on Drakeside Road or what they were facing on Mill Road down to High Street to the middle of town. The town does what they have to do. The state the t you know, has just, uh, they're not doing what has to be done and it's not fair to the taxpayers. It's not fair to the people that live on Boar's Head. They don't have any drains. The water comes rushing down there. The state, the town, until these drains are put in and a plan is made, they can't put drains in that would take that water away. So that water is basically coming down and sitting on um, Ocean Boulevard. And it's got to the point where it's really uh, crucial, the problems that are happening. Um, and the I just don't understand how, why they would plan on some of the things that have happened recently I've become aware of is now that, particularly since last week's meeting, um, they realized that I was very upset when this happened because the Board of Selectmen has sent, we did a unanimous uh, motion where all five members supported that we go Maybe not only, I think we did it all the way to High Street. Correct. But particularly, this was already included. And many people have made plans and people have bought property. People are trying to sell property. This is an important issue. Another issue that sits out there that just sits there and goes nowhere and gets kicked around constantly is about the bathhouse down at the corner of Winniconnet Road. Uh, that really can't be done until this is taken care of. I mean, why should we let them build that bathhouse and then stick it right onto the, uh, all the drainage that we already have down on Winniconnet Road that the town has already provided? They need to, uh, this will help them deal with the problem that they have there also. And there's many, some people want the bathhouse, some people don't want the bathhouse, but it's time to come up with some answers here. Um, the, uh, I mentioned about how they lit, took a lot of the input from Facebook, so I'm not really sure where William Rose uh, figures that he, he was, he got the, pl his plan for this project was right from the beginning, he only really wanted to go to um, Boar's Head. I'm not sure if there were some subcommittees that were, where he talked to people, um, from the area commission, but this is a problem that affects all taxpayers of Hampton. We, the, many people like to go to the fireworks. You should see the people walk from Winniconnet Road down to the main area. Um, and one of the other problems that I've thought about too is basically they're making it so that there's going to be only two lanes of traffic, one going north, one going south. And as, um, um, 
Lynn Larson commented earlier, we're looking forward to having two lanes of traffic there. It will go a long way to uh, preventing a lot of the motorcycle noise, and it will make it a more civil place to live. Uh, but why would they leave four lanes of traffic in this area, four lanes for traffic, when down at the main part of the beach is only going to be two lanes? and possibly three lanes. It's still being kicked around whether it's going to be two lanes from the Ashworth North or whether there's going to be another third lane that goes north of Church Street. So there, a lot of this is still up in the air. William Rose told me at one time that they had the $28,000. Now all of a sudden there's no money, but yet there is $131,000 still there to work with, but he says that he needs it for other things. All I know is that the town of Hampton continuously is paying, uh, what's it estimated, 16, 20 million dollars that we pay in taxes that come from the room and meals tax, uh, the parking, that, yeah. Yeah. It's all this other stuff. It's about million dollars. Yeah, this it's just so much and yet we are going to be put out and when they told me that they were going to drop, bring this into the uh, uh, 10 year plan of 2028 when I'm 78 years old, that's ridiculous. I have lived at this place for 54 uh, years, and I have n and I love living there. It's a wonderful place to live. Um, but I've seen the lady that lives next door to me that's 80 years old now, and I'm, she's trying to sell her property. I really yeah, I shiver when I think of how her life has been, and her husband before he passed away has been impacted by the water flushing into their yard and they have a mud flat in the back. Every time a truck goes by, uh, they sm the water smashes into uh, her windows and it just is like, you know, someone, we, re we deserve some peace and quiet in our property. Other towns, I've looked into it, there, are, uh, there has been some lawsuits in places like Rye where uh, the town of Rye has, because they, caused some problems where water drained onto people's property, they had to pay up. And uh, I think it would be just good if the state would try to uh, remedy this problem, um, that people don't want to have to sue or don't want to have to go to those extreme measures when really we want some consideration and we're not being given any consideration here. And I think that if something isn't done here, I think the time has come for the town to do something. They, we need to renegotiate our plans with the state because this is in, unacceptable, in my opinion. And I'm looking for uh, the town to take a position that's strong. I think we need to send a, uh, a uh, proposition to William Rose, a letter of some sort. I think that we need to tell uh, uh, send letters to the people that represent the town of Hampton, Chuck Rage, uh, Bob Ladd, uh, they are representing the village district. This area is in the village district. Why? And when you're a member of the village district, you're paying more taxes. So all of these people have paid more taxes than anybody else uh, in Hampton uh, that is not in the village district. Uh, and we're not given some consideration and I think it's a problem. So I think we have to work with our representatives, including John Nyan. Uh, again, these people are only advisory and we have a better position that we should be speaking up and doing something about this now. So I'm just wondering what can we do? Do you, do you want to make a motion that, that we send a letter to uh, the other uh, we request that William Rose come in here and meet with us? I mean, hmm. well, not? I will tell you that uh, I'll go back again a little bit. Um, one of the things that happened um, after I talked about this, um, in fact, it was actually even before the meeting last, it was two weeks ago, I saw the people out in the lady's front yard because she's gone away, she's not there right now. And so I went over, as I always do, and I know all these people, and let me tell you, they're very nice people that work for DOT. They've been very respectful, they try to help, they, they try multiple times 
The problem is, after 10 years, I've seen them doing the same things over and over and over again. It's totally a waste of money because there isn't an answer for this and uh, without doing something more. Um, but he says, well, I think I've come up with an idea. They want to take 20 feet of her front yard and grade it off at the apex of it into the marsh so that the water just goes right into the marsh. At first I thought, well, I don't know. I don't think that would work. But the very next day we had a deluge. I went out there and I think that it's not really a bad idea, but it's not my land. I don't know what the lady thinks. And be, this is even beyond her at this point. I don't know what's going to happen, but somebody that's representing her, like her children or whatever, are going to have to look into this. Uh, D, D, DOT did give me um, her their phone number to give her as soon as I make contact with her. She's been there like continuously for the last three years. Now, ever since something's come up like this, she's not there. So after I complain, then the next day, uh, I see William Rose at the Hampton Area Commission, and I told him, I said, you know, here I see you trying to uh, make, a, they, they must have already been working on it, realizing that they're not going to have the money or whatever, so now they're coming up with other alternatives. They could have come up with these alternatives 10 years ago. So why are they doing it now? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Then, the next day, it was a Thursday night, so the next day was Friday. Next, the very next day, there were people there from DOT. Then they were there the last week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Sometimes spending as much as three hours there with multiple people and trucks, they blew out all the line, lines that are there. All of these things they've done over and over again. They ought to have a, you know, I don't think it changes it much. It might have worked a little bit. But the other thing that they've done is they didn't have the $28,000, but they are spending $25,000 at uh, uh, Little Jack's, where, which they got a, they had that uh, permit that they got from the, uh, Army Corps. Army Corps of Engineers, and that had that was done five years ago. It yeah. was let they let it uh, lapse. Then they had to get it again, and it did cost twenty five thousand dollars. So I'm all in favor of that. I'm in favor of anything they want to do. What I'm not in favor of is uh, limiting it to the scope of this project so that it's not included at least to Winnicott Road, if not all the way to High Street. Why don't, why don't you make a motion that, that we have him come in here and? Discuss it. And the the guys that letter. when I was th talking to these guys this week, they even offered to come in. The guys that offered yeah. that want to grade this property down, yeah. so they're willing to come. So I would make a motion that we invite them, and uh, and that we also send letters to everybody on the Hampton Area Commission and tell them how we feel. Uh, they are advisory. We are here for the taxpayers of Hampton, and I think they should know how we feel. They're relying on 81 responses from Facebook when there were many people uh, from this area that were there talking and making decisions, and then they, all of a sudden they just drop it. I think it's disgusting, and something okay. needs to be done. So you made a motion? I'll second it. All in favor? So, Thank Fred, you. do you want to... We will put something together put in a draft letter together. form and, and shoot that by the board members to see how you okay. feel about it. And and you give us some edits to it, please, and, and let us know if we need to include more items. Okay. I am meeting with a representative of DOT later on this week, um, hopefully. It's tentative right now, uh, to discuss Ocean Boulevard. Yeah. So, and okay. I will tell you that Bill uh, Watson yeah. has done a wonderful job and he would like to do, I mean, they try to say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we could, yeah, you know, we need action on this. We don't need it's Bill false I'm meeting promises. With. It's Bill I'm going to meet with, so. He's a good he's guy. He's a very good guy. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, super. All right. Thank you. Uh, Hampton Beach State Park. Who is that? That's me, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to just have a couple of remarks before check. Come on in and uh, just stand by, please. Uh, before we do my, uh, not Facebook, but uh, my uh, PowerPoint presentation, if uh, a guy as old as I can accomplish that. Um, Rick, Rick just uh, talked at length uh, about uh, a tyranny of the public sector, uh, and it is uh, one that's characterized by neglect, uh, 
despotism, uh, an autocratic a non-response to the citizenry. Uh, it's totalitarian. It's centered around the flagpole and conquered. I've been on this board for five and a half consecutive years. We've raised this flag incessantly. Uh, we have uh, incurred the unreasonable uh, standards from the state, and we've we've voiced our uh, our exclamation about two hundred million dollars in, in overall revenue that is sent from this within this within this town, taxpayers and families and, and youngsters and young young married folks and young property owners. Uh, to support the state. And uh, we've got uh, police services on this beach, and we're going to continue, in, and this is a, a great segue, Rick's comments, into uh, um, the tyranny at the uh, state park system. But $200 million, uh, I know implicitly, if not explicitly, when we had this agreement for the 10-year plan, and, and uh, to, we had a three-to-two two vote. And I think implicitly we, we understood that Rick's neck of the woods would be uh, um, rehabilitated. Yeah. And now that's off the table. And as a consideration for that, maybe we need to reconsider our vote uh, with the state uh, in terms of our commitment, because we feel that deal has been broken. And again, it, it is tyrannical. Uh, last week, I uh, uh, went to the state house on these same issues, uh, and I spoke with the uh, speaker's uh, key staff. I spoke with uh, Aaron and Meg and Elliot, uh, and uh, I spoke with uh, the minority leader. I spoke with uh, the majority leader uh, staff and uh, asked that they uh, inform the governor of uh, at least my intention, both as a state rep and uh, as a selectman, on this tyranny and what, what occurs down here. And uh, specifically, we're talking about the beach, and there's a, a Hampton Beach State Park public meeting uh, on May 16th, and we're all invited from Brian Wilson. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I can make that meeting, and uh, um, but certainly these remarks here tonight, and I'll be as, as lengthy as, and concise and hopefully as cogent as Rick has been, um, they're going to talk about their winter operations. And uh, that to me is a joke. Uh, there are no winter operations. Uh, there's a, a bobcat down there. There's no inland marine equipment. Uh, there just aren't any. It's, uh, it, it honestly looks like a third world nation. And where does this get Hampton? Well, we police it. Well, our values of property are undervalued. Our tax revenues are undervalued. Our people are overtaxed. Uh, and it, it, it hurts commerce. It hurts people at work. It, shut down, it shuts down commerce at the beach. And it's been doing this. And again, this is tyrannical. And uh, we have spoken. There'll be some addressing of uh, the Hampton Beach Area Commission uh, chairperson in his remarks. Uh, We've got law enforcement department head uh, concerns uh, down here at the state uh, beach. We've got chamber of commerce that has to beg for uh, their permits every year. When they've been doing it for 15 years, it should be presented. Um, but we're going to step into um, some data. And I guess um, what's really uh, important is, you know, the numbers and financials. And it's difficult to dig those out. Here we are in halfway through 2017. I have been to the legislative research branch in Concord. Wonderful, wonderful uh, staff there. Immediate response. Uh, there's just one problem. Uh, the 2015 financial annual report for the uh, dread, as they call it, aptly so in this case, uh, is the last report that's available. There is no 2016. So it's going on a year and a half since uh, that should be on the street. And it's not complex. It's the same lines. It's the same revenue. Uh, there's a slight increase, maybe 3 or 4 percent. But as, as folks that support that beach, and you'll see the revenue numbers from this PowerPoint, uh, there's been an examination of the old uh, data from 14 and 15. Again, it's a tyranny, and it, it's, it's a neglect, and it's an abuse of, of Hampton citizens. Uh, the governor has proclaimed that he's going to see 100 businesses in 100 days. Uh, Hampton is one of the most important businesses in the state, one of the most important businesses in New England, uh, and it has the tourist numbers to prove it, and Hampton is the dog wagging the tail. Without us, Hampton Beach and these revenue numbers collapse, and the state does nothing to support that infrastructure. And uh, we've been very nice. Rick just made a nice presentation. There's nothing personal about this. This is strictly business, and this is strictly numbers, and it's tyrannical, and it's abusive, and it's abusive to the people of this town. The governor said he's going to visit 100 businesses. He was in chamber last week in Concord, said if anybody wants to come and see him, come see him. I'll request a meeting with the governor. I've gone through the chain. I'm a new guy up there, uh, and uh, I will ask for five minutes of his time. 
and I'll speak for two or three minutes like this, provide that, that uh, package. He's been informed of our intent and how dissatisfied we are through Chris Elm, who called me, had the courtesy to call me back. Uh, but Rick's right. Uh, this is this going not getting better. It's getting worse. And uh, Brian is going to show uh, plug me in here and show some pictures and do some numbers on the data. This will take about five minutes, but a picture's worth more than a thousand words, and uh, it's not pretty. And the numbers aren't pretty. Can I just say one thing? Sure, please. Uh, I will. We forgot to mention about sending a letter also to Chris Sununu. He is well informed of this, including the part of Boar's Head to uh, Winnicott Road. He, I talked to him and met with him twice, and he knows all about it. So we need to include him. Okay. And Fran McMahon also from the building, Fran, part yeah. of the committee. So pardon me for the. Uh, um, uh, slideshow on the left that shows all the slides but again this really is tyrannical at the beach and it, it's for all the reasons that Rick's described all the reasons that uh, I've described and all the reasons that people know and uh, it's consistent and it is uh, perennial and here is uh, right next to the office where on May 16th they're going to have their um, their show uh, this is at the 20 million dollar renovation this is this is the tyranny of the public sector um, this is uh, right next to the beautiful corner office at the state, and this is on May 2nd. And Max, I see you're, you're stepping up. I'll, get, I'll be happy to get you a copy of this PowerPoint slide. But this is the standard on 2 May, 33 days after uh, they have started to collect for meters. And this is right next to the 20 million, they're the headquarters, the actual epicenter of the headquarters at the state, and Brian, I'm off. Here we go. We on again um, of of the beach, and you see the sand, and you see um, the and is this on the screen? It is. You see the uh, the degradation and the decrepitude at the main beach, and this is the crown jewel of Hampton Beach. And as I say, in the, as it shows in the slide, this is next to the office at the state park at Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. And we'll get into the numbers of, of what goes down here. Here you look at the fence and they talk about winter operations. I guess, unlike the town of Hampton and every other corporation, they can't work. And many people don't go to the beach in the winter. Many people don't go to the beach in the summer. I'm down there all the time. Jim's down there all the time. You are. You live there. Uh, our crews are. This is the beach. This is the fence. This is what it looks like. It looks ghetto. It looks third world nation. The governor should have a real keen interest in this. This is, is, is rampant throughout that chain, throughout that uh, fence system. It's unsafe. It's uh, a tort issue, uh, and it, it's, it really is a uh, ghetto. This is about four or five sections where that's, that, that fence has been ripped off the top. I don't know how that happens, but certainly when it does happen, with the amount of money that the state takes out of here, and when you look at the revenue numbers from two years ago at this, this park, this is an unacceptable standard. And those that permit this uh, really have no place in government. Uh, they have no place uh, in leadership positions, and it's time that there is uh, some regime change down there. We're moving on. Again, it gets worse. Here's large, huge. You let your child go for a couple of minutes, uh, and that's the $20 million they just spent. And nobody does this except for government. And the sad thing is this is the perception that colors many people's minds about government. And there's so much good government in this exposure that Dredd and Phil Bryce and the Commissioner of Dread allow, and it colors the perception, and this perception is reality, because this was on May 2nd. Now we go to the stairs, and those were, the day before this was a very busy day, and we'll get into the operations aspect. This is what the crown jewel of Hampton Beach looks like. Many parts of New York City look much better than this on a Saturday night. Again, May 2nd, you would think with that warm day that was on May 1st or just on that weekend, uh, again, the benches are stacked up and the sand is there. So uh, we don't even show the pictures of the winter, but it, it is ab abhorrent. So you need corrective steps down there and immediate action. And uh, leadership really needs to be replaced or reassigned um, from the commissioner and the director level. Uh, they just don't need to be there. They're not getting the job done. Uh, you look at the finances, and it even speaks to this. Anybody that supports that kind of asset degradation, anybody that supports that type of operation, uh, has a standard that is much different than the average business owner, the average property owner, and the average government employee. And certainly, it wouldn't stand for a second in the town of Hampton 
but right in that boundary, right in that phase line, that's permitted to be status quo. And that lingers today, those same fences. 2015, again, uh, the 2016 financials have not been released. Uh, they're not readily produced. And these are some points of interest. Uh, the commissioner in 2015 uh, asserts that we continue uh, to be successful. I assert that's incorrect and that's wrong. This, that, that is not a success story. It's a revenue success story for the state, and it, it's an unmitigated disaster for people here, except for seven or eight, nine weeks of the year when they, they actually step up their operations. The all funds approach breeds mediocrity in state government. It breeds inequity to Hampton taxpayers, business owners, and neglect was just shown in those pictures. And Lord knows, in the winter, it looks much worse. Um, there are 122 state parks in this state. Many of them are simply wilderness and mountains. 46 generate revenue, and just one in four provide cash flow. The Hampton Beach transfers $1.6 million alone just from our meters. $1.6 million is just swept right out. Doesn't go to uh, any Hampton advantage, none, zero. And Cannon, which does $7 million in sales, they only contribute to the total park system of $0.32 million, $300,000. So here we have this, this seasonal thing. And we'll get into Cannon's metrics in a bit, and stay tuned to this because it's, it's alarming. I've talked about it before. You don't get anywhere. So the Hampton meter, the gross revenue, is $2.2 million. We employ people. Cannon, and that's just our meters, Cannon does $7 million, and they contribute $300,000 a year. Mount Washington has revenues of $1.5 million, but they lose money. So you see, our facility in Hampton is the gold standard, and it's neglected as though it were a third world nation. The 2015 financials continue. There's a seasonal staff cost increase of 197,000 over 2015 to provide more services to non-revenue operating parks. And pardon me, I don't have my glasses, so it's tough for me to read. Um, so that's my question, is that really the number? Um, is there $197,000 more going to additional parks and Hampton gets shortchanged, we get nothing? Cannon Mountain, we just talked about them, secured in 2015 $750,000 in capital appropriations and upgrades. We got nothing. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'll grab those. Uh, from the financials in the park system, uh, from my, my perusal, it is total compensation up 7%, and I think it is from 14 to 15, and I'd be interested in knowing if it's up from 14 to 16. And we know through our budget process, we know through personnel costs, we know through uh, uh, running a business, total compensation is up 7%, and you saw the pictures of what we get in Hampton. The Seacoast Meters had a $20,000 equipment expense. That's what was allotted for equipment in the 2015 year, and they do $1.6 million in transfers to the state. Cannon, which does $322,000 or $300,000 transfer to the state, received $109,000 in equipment expense. And that's on top of the seven hundred fifty, dollars according to the statements, in capital appropriations and upgrades. And this is all coming from what was sent to me, uh, and you can't see it, but the 2015 financial report that I hold now in my left hand. Here's an interesting one. Cannon has promotional budgeting um, from the state from its operations for $313,000 a year. We assert that Hampton is a 12-month year-round destination, and we have a sister uh, enterprise uh, that contributes far less than we do, uh, getting $313,000 to market people to drive directly by Hampton and go to Cannon Mountain. Hampton gets zero. And let me say that again. They get 300, they kick in $300,000 to the kitty, Cannon Mountain does, in just this line alone, forget the $750,000 in capital uh, appropriations. Forget the 109,000 for equipment. Here's another 313,000 that goes directly to Cannon Mountain to take them up to the mountain so they don't come in Hampton and enjoy Hampton, because they don't want to, because the park looks the way it does and it's not plowed. Uh, and in the summertime, to, to get people up to the mountain and not spend money in Hampton and not recreate in Hampton and not support our businesses. Hampton Beach promotional budget lines from 2014 from 2015 is zero. I don't know what the buy is on advertising, 
but uh, six thousand bucks a week, or if it's if it's uh, um, concentrated on uh, winter weekends or summer weekends, is a, a competitive advantage. The statement says there's four point two million dollars in retained earnings. If I'm reading uh, that correctly, that's a question mark. Uh, why aren't we producing more of that money uh, for the benefit of the people that produce it? Again, the thirty-three other state pro par parks produce a combined one million of revenue, which is a fraction of what just our meters produce. Hampton Beach Recreation Vehicles, $736 million in revenue. So those campers that you see at the state park. And the revenue, the net revenue is $500,000. So you're over two million bucks with, with recreational vehicles and the meters. In these financials, and I've got to do some more digging, uh, the ones that we have that are, are going on two years old, the expenses are not broken out. So you can't do any real uh, analysis of expenses and increases. Again, 2015 financials continued. And this, this goes right along with what Rick says, how neglected we are. Cannon Mountain has $7.5 million in revenue and nets $535,000. Hampton Beach smokes Cannon Mountain and gets no support, gets no capital expenditures, gets no advertising expense, and gets no equipment. Again, the meters, $2.2 million in revenue and a $1.6 million net that's swept right off. Hampton Beach Recreation Vehicle Maintenance Equipment. You heard what Cannon gets? $30,000 is what they put in down there. Hampton Beach Seashell Maintenance. Now you saw what the beach looked like. You saw what it looked like on May 2nd. They've been collecting meters. That number is says $712. So we've got a multi-million dollar organization. We've got a, a, a decrepit state of assets down there that we just spent 20 million, the crown jewel. They spent $712. It's, it's, it's a shame, and if there's no, no, no more glaring uh, example of tyranny and neglect of state assets, and people that, that do this in the private sector, in the state, is a, this is a business down there. You know, there's plows, there's construction, there's state police. Those are government services. This is a business down there. This is a hospitality business. This is a recreational business. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The state does not need to be in the recreation business, and this is how they run it. $712 for maintenance. The Hampton Beach Seashell Equipment. You saw what Cannon got, $275. You can't make this up. The Hampton Meters compensation, is it up 8.6% from, from, uh, from uh, 2014? And what's it up for 2016? And if it is, why, if we went automated, are we spending more money on meters? Uh, I don't have the answer to that question. Uh, I have a question on how much the pay is up. Again, you have to dig. The expenses aren't articulated in the financials very well. Nothing like we produce here and businesses produce for full transparency. The courses of action going forward. Uh, make no bones about it. This standard of leadership is, is unacceptable. Uh, we need new, new leadership at Dread or a realignment up there. Uh, we need it at the, uh, at the commissioner level, and we need it right down here at uh, uh, the director's level down here. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This has gone on for five years. It's getting worse. Anybody that takes a brand new park and runs it in this condition with these type of maintenance figures, with these types of revenue, does not deserve to be on board. Uh, the additional promotional equipment, uh, the additional promotional uh, expenditures, Hampton needs that. We need equal play. We need the same, or we need more for equipment. We need maintenance expenditures, and we need it at the Hampton Beach State Park. Mr. Welch is an expert in public works. He will tell you that a bobcat doesn't cut it. We need John Deere. We need heavy equipment. We need to reinvest in this stellar state park system 12 months a year that is producing the revenue, and we need to do it 12 months a year. Cannon has both a summer budget and a winter budget. Hampton Beach has very little of either. We need to amortize the expenses of the operations over 12 months and make this a 12-month destination. The plowing and the sanding of the parking lots and the beach area and the infrastructure should gleam, just as they do up north, just as they do at Cannon. We're not second-class citizens. This is tyrannical, and it, it certainly has to stop, and we need new leadership. We need to requain, retain requisite funding for operations from our operations. We are simply, uh, the state is, taking too much money in and taking too much money out and shoveling it out the door and not supporting the operation. 
we need to include Dan in us too. Yes, we do. And here, here you know, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here real quick because you, you know, you, you can you can talk and you can talk and talk. And the governor's going to have a conversation, His Excellency, and he he he's interested in this information as as the majority leader was and the minority leader. Under dread, the state park leadership and the directorship has lost the confidence based upon their operations of low standards. And anybody that supports those numbers, anybody that supports those stats, anybody supports not producing financials well over a year, anybody supports that type of abuse of government and, and uh, business property uh, really isn't fit to be uh, in a leadership position. The Town of Hampton Law Enforcement Chief Executive has a perennial tactical and strategic operational concern that are unmet by dread. Let me say that again. Chief Executive, the Town of Hampton Law Enforcement has perennial, long-term, tactical, and strategic operational concerns that are unmet by dread. That says a lot, and for those of you, I'm not parsing words, that is a very, very dangerous and significant statement. Lifeguard operation leadership at the state park has lost confidence in the leadership down there. On May 2nd, pandemonium, we're not staffed, we have no lifeguards out, we have crime committed on the beach, you've seen the pictures of the waste, then we've got the operational safety, we've got the protection of life. It's a carnival. We're putting our police officers at risk, the state is not stepping up, they're not leading, they're not doing anything. Importantly, there's dangerous staffing levels and these lack of strategic view and this tactical standards or lack of them, they imperil human life in the water and on the beach. And we've had some incidents down there last year when we're fully staffed, and uh, society seems to get more dangerous and more liberal with its conduct. And uh, it's a very explosive and dangerous situation down there. Again, uh, the chairman of the Hampton Beach Area Commission has lost confidence in the director, Phil Bryce, at Hampton Beach. And those are words he spoke to me directly, not once but twice. The governor of New Hampshire recently asked, and this was last week, for the resignation of the New Hampshire Hospital CEO for staffing shortages. They were two psychiatrists short. And the governor put the hand down and he asked for the resignation for being two psychiatrists short. So he's not immune from responding to uh, glaring, glaring leadership deficiencies that exist here in Hampton. The governor, as it was reported in the press, and the governor's council were outraged as reported by the media. Well, this is a serious outrage. It's not two people not showing up. It's complete absence of leadership and a complete absence of an abdication of responsibility. So it's well past time for the governor, His Excellency, to address this leadership at the Hampton Beach Park. Uh, I will request and bring Randy Cushing, one of each, Democrat, one Republican, and it goes up there, keep it so we'll include the uh, minority leader and the majority leader, we write the letter. But again, that would be my input to um, uh, the governor. It would be my input, it would perhaps all of our input, that uh, this will stand no longer in the town of Hampton and the citizens of Hampton and those trying to conduct commerce uh, are not going to suffer from this tyranny any further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, moving on, would you like to address the purchasing policy, Fred? Jim, can I get this off the question. screen because we're not we're not back on the screen yet. Yeah, I think I got to take. No, we're back there. We are okay. Good. Yeah. Thank I you. Think, I think we're. Good I just would oh. want to mention again. I forgot. I I was thinking about uh, Dan Ennis. We we need to invite him at the same time of William Rose, uh, and we need to have him in here more often. We're getting no. Uh, it's nothing like when Nancy Stiles was there. Of course, we all knew that was going to happen. Yeah. But I think we need to make sure that he realizes that these are issues and we need to keep hitting him with them. Okay. I agree with Rick because yep. I think we need to hit Dread with some other stuff. They're taking that much money for us and they can give millions of dollars to other countries, that don't, to other uh, towns and cities that don't contribute as much as Hampton. And we got major infrastructure issues that, guess what, they rely on just as heavily as we do. So I think we do need to get Dan in here as well. Okay. Point well made. Purchasing policy? Uh, we're confusion. confusion. We're <laughs> Actually, there's no confusion. It's only perceived to be confusion. Okay. <clears throat> the purchasing policy hasn't changed. The board debated this issue over a year ago. And because we had so many, and we received so many complaints from various people, particularly the Taxpayers Association, uh, so-called, that we were giving too many waivers, that we were 
we were not following the policy, that we didn't have enough bidders, and so on and so forth. And and that's true. I mean, we were giving a lot of waivers. Uh, and we still have problems trying to get people to come in and bid. In fact, we now insist that we have at least 10 companies that we send bid documents to every time we send a bid out. The policy hasn't changed. But the board debated uh, and had us draft up a policy on, which you haven't changed yet, uh, was in you, you know, said you went from twenty five thousand to fifty thousand during during the debate, but you didn't make a decision on that. You just said draft up some policies and show us. Well, we did. We never got to it. Uh, it nothing was ever signed to change. Nothing has still been signed. Not signed to change. Um, we gave you the policy draft uh, when they went back and recouped and, and went back over all the processes because we were having some problems with uh, purchasing. And uh, I took some strong action at one point. Uh, I actually disciplined some employees for inappropriate activities with regards to uh, purchasing. Um, the policy is there for you to read. You haven't changed it yet. Uh, we're not suggesting that you change it. We just gave you what you were talking about in general terms, okay? Um, uh, to me, it doesn't make any difference whether you make the policy a dollar or a million dollars. It doesn't make any difference. We're going to do what you tell us to do. And right now, we have an established policy. And that policy is still in effect. We haven't changed it. Nor have you changed it. We can't change it at all. It takes the board to change it. One of the things that we would like to do is to continue to evolve that policy more strictly on the management side of the policy. As you know, there's two portions of the policy. One is the policy itself, which tells you what you've got to do and how you've got to do it. And the other one is the management portion of the policy, which gives you instructions on how to fill out the forms or when things must be, be brought forward and so forth. They're not the rule. They're simply an explanation of what you need to do. And we want to continue to evolve that as time goes along because we need to do that. Right now, the policy is $25,000, $20,000, excuse me. Uh, anything over 15 has to be bid. Uh, we, we, we request uh, written uh, documentation on all the bids. We request uh, information that's sent to uh, my office so the bids can be started. Departments write bids. They send them up. We review them. We put in the, the what they call a, the, 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 the uh, the framework of the bid so that uh, all of the bids are the same as far as what the legal requirements are. And then we farm those out and, and, and take in bid documents. If it comes in and there are a number of bidders, at least three bidders, and it comes in, uh, the statute allows me to, and the regulation allows me to award the bid provided that the bid is under $50,000. If it's over, 50, if it's $50,000 or more, it has to come to the board for approval. That's where the $50,000 comes from. So you have to approve all bids over 50000 I have the responsibility to approve all justified bids as long as there are either three required bidders or more uh, up to $50,000. That's the way the ordinance works. That's the way it's always worked. That's the way it's going to continue to work until you folks actually physically change it. And there's some confusion about what we actually do here as opposed to what, you know, people think we do. And we do exactly what the policy says. Now. We have had some problems with uh, incorrect purchase orders, incorrect uh, uh, requests for expenditure of funds. When those come in, we don't approve them. They go back to the department with instructions to fix them. Read the policy and fix it in accordance with the, with the policy enacted by the Board of Selectmen, or I won't sign it. And you can't purchase those supplies and materials or whatever it happens to be without my signature if it's over $1,000. I won't sign it. I refuse to sign it, and I keep continually send things back if they are wrong. Once in a while, we have a uh, purchase order received, and I'm using purchase order as a generic explanation, uh, a request to expend funds, and it's not even signed. Those go back to the departments. Review it, find out what's wrong with it, send it back properly. We do that on a regular basis. Uh, if there's a problem, and there was a problem recently, and I'm because it was a, a problem that involves some discipline. I can't discuss it in public. Uh, but we, we sent a disciplinary letter out to an employee uh, because the policy wasn't followed. 
and we'll continue to do that if the policy is not followed and we have multiple cha multiple problems with a particular department or an employee. That's the way we administer the policy. That's what's there. Nothing has changed. So we everything over fifteen thousand dollars goes to bid. Goes to bid, unless directed otherwise by the board. There are some exceptions. Uh, for instance, all public works equipment that exceeds thirty-five thousand dollars in cost, of course, we already bid it by statute has to be bid. That's just the law in the state, and there is a lot of that effect in the statutes. But since we have a lower threshold, we bid it automatically anyhow. There are also the requirements that, that uh, there are certain things under federal and state grants that have to be worked in a different fashion than a straight bid. And we follow that in accordance with the state law. So, but virtually everything is bid. So is this amount, is this, it used to be 5,000, then it went to 15,000? That's what the board changed, yes. So when I first got here, it was $5,000. And uh, we weren't being very successful at that level because we weren't getting any bidders. People just wouldn't fill the paperwork out. And the board did eventually, after talking about this for some period of time, did increase it to fifteen thousand dollars. And Which that's where it stands. Is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it was a mistake in 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 reading, in reading and understanding. Reading and, and understanding. Th this was this was a draft of what you had talked about. So that you continue to talk, and that's all it is. Nothing has changed. Good. Nor is anything going to unless you change it. Any questions? Okay. No. Closing comments. I just again, I just have to say this because it, it comes to me as I sit here. Uh, didn't you go, Fred, to uh, Washington to help get that? Uh, grant for three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars with Nancy Stiles and a delegation of people. Nancy, uh, John Nyan, and myself went to D.C. We talked to the Federal Highway Administration. We we went and, and met with uh, all of our uh, delegation. Uh, let's see, we met with all but one. The representative from our district wasn't there that day, but we did meet with the other representative uh, uh, from the western side of the state, and he all four. Representatives and senators signed it. Uh, we met with both senators, uh, Kelly Ayotte and, and uh, Jean Shaheen. In fact, Jean was presiding in the Senate when we got there, and she recessed the Senate so she'd come out and talk to us. That's how important it was to her to see that something got done here. So Hampton's been a part of it right from the very beginning, because that $375,000 is the money that's planning this project right now. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn, 2116. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Adjourned.